Good morning, everybody. Monday morning quarterback, episode 129. Uh, thank you for joining us. Glad you could be here. Um, we just got back from a big quarter midget race in Georgia. Um, had a great results there for uh, the fast kids on CSI Shocks. Uh, Seth Christensen won a heavy Honda. His brother Lane won a senior Honda, which was, I think, Lane's first race, um, big race up in the, the senior classes. Gunnar Pio won Light 160. Uh, Hayden Wise won Light World Formula. Uh, Caleb Eddington, Unrestricted Animal, and Max Reeves in Formula Mod. So congratulations to all those kids. Super tough race uh, to win with over a couple hundred cars and glad we could be there uh, helping our customers. Um, our next big race we're traveling to again is a quarter midget race and that is uh, the Pit Logic Clash in North Carolina in two weeks. And then sprint car racing starts ramping up around here. So um, our shock trader will be at a bunch of those events. You can find our schedule um, on the support button on our website. And uh, it says uh, trackside support. And you can see where that trailer is going to be. Um, as I mentioned last week, since we moved to the noon time slot, we are going to um, start this week's episode with uh, questions from last week that came in after the show ended and then uh, we'll jump into today's topic which is going to be uh, quarter midget shock design since we're fresh off a quarter midget race um, it seems like every big event I'm at I get a lot of questions on standard shock versus through shaft and so we kind of want to talk through that um, as that's a topic we've never covered on Monday morning quarterback if you're not a quarter midget guy no problem stay tuned in you might pick something up and we'll answer your questions at the end if if they're not related to this topic, that's 100% okay. Um, so the one question we had last week uh, after the show ended was from Austin Drukey. And he asked, We were, remember we were talking about the progressive uh, bump spring kit that we're releasing this week. And uh, all the different types of kits and, and why we do, whether it's foam in a cup or our standard progressive puck kit. And Austin's question was, would we shorten the bump rubber gap on the progressive uh, puck style kit versus going to a foam and a cup um, since uh, it would engage sooner but be a softer rate and still be a progressive rate. Um, so uh, that's a little bit of a loaded question. It kind of depends on the exact situation, Austin. So um, you're right, shortening that gap would still be a progressive rate. However, if we got into that too soon, that progressive rate builds very, very fast, um, and it can effectively be stiffer than the foam in the cup. So it would really depend there. Um, the progressive rate uh, style kit is really soft initially, but then at some point it crosses over the linearity of the foam and it keeps building and the foam kind of stays linear. So um, a progressive kit um, can build rate um, at a much higher pace than the linear um, just by the shape of the curve. So that kind of depends on where you're at and, and what kind of track. So I hope that answers your question. Um, again, today's topic, 129, is quarter midget styles. Okay, different design styles. So this first shock, um, this is actually a JR3. So uh, our very first generation was a just RS Junior, and then we had a JR2 and a JR3. Um, the Junior, the 2, and the 3 were all based off of um, the AFCO design. So when we first started with the quarter midget shock, um, we felt AFCO had a pretty good piece and we could take it to the next level with the billet piston um, and some tuning on the base valve and some different things. So that's what we did. And then it kept evolving from there. Um, this shock, anything junior, JR2, JR3, could come plugged or with a Schrader valve um, if that was your choice. If it had a Schrader valve, you need to run pressure in it. So that's a common question we get. Um, they got a Schrader valve on it, they never checked the gas pressure. If you don't have gas in it, the shock's gonna cavitate, um, it's gonna be bubbles in the air bubbles in the shock, it's not gonna perform properly, um, you're not gonna get the most out of it. So if you have a Schrader valve on your shock, you've gotta set the pressure. If you don't know what pressure to set, give us a call, we can walk you through that based on um, the class, the track, what the build of the shock is. We can tell you the minimum pressure, the maximum pressure, and get you in range. Um, from this, uh, before the JR4 came out, we released the JRX, which was a through shaft. Um, revolutionary for 
quarter midget shocks. Um, we dominated the parking lot national races with this shock for about three years. Uh, just performed a fair bit better than our standard shock. And in the shock world, especially on the quarter midget side, it's hard to make a huge gain with shock design or development. And this certainly did that. Um, we sold thousands of them and it's been an absolute fantastic performing shock. It still is a top performing shock. It's performance with the JR4 is parallel. We'll talk about that in a moment. The downside to the through shaft, which we didn't necessarily uh, have the foresight to see into is since we're sealing it in two spots, um, one repair costs are more expensive because we're replacing twice as many seals, twice as many wipers, um, pretty intricate little, little shock. Um, and then two, since we are sealing in two spots, the distance between repairs um, is much shorter. So one of these shocks, 15, 20 races, absolute tops, and they need freshen. Where our standard quarter minute shock can go 25 or 30. So almost double the longevity um, between repairs. Um, so guys who have this shock, I say, hey, look, if you're competing at a national level, you keep your stuff really fresh, you're on top of your maintenance, this shock's great. If you got a bunch of them, don't get rid of them, but you have to stay on top of the maintenance. If you're a, a club level racer and you maybe bought a car that had these on it and you're not going to get them maintained um, as frequently as they need, you probably want to get rid of them because when these things go over 20 races, you start having leaks and issues and once they leak oil, um, they just don't perform good, right? And then the performance is actually even worse than an old style standard shock. So great performing shock if you stay on top of it. What we wanted to do though, since that had became a little bit of an issue with folks not staying on top of the maintenance, which we understand if you're a club racer, you want to bolt the shocks on and race and not worry about all the maintenance. Um, we started to work really, really hard to bridge that gap between our standard shock and our through shaft. And that's where the JR4 came in. So this is a brand new shock, um, top to bottom, 100% designed in house. Uh, manufactured with our machine shops here locally and what we had did was um, we got rid of the Schrader valve some people said wow what about the Schrader valve we found so many folks never setting their gas pressure we just wanted to eliminate that what we did was we put a spring in there to simulate the pressure so zero maintenance required as far as Schrader valve um, we went with a floating seal head design which is hard to see but that allowed us to uh, minimize seal drag and stiction, improve the response of the shock, um, a brand new base valve design. Anyhow, after about a year of development, this shock was on par performance wise with the through shaft, doesn't need maintenance as frequently, and is uh, a couple hundred bucks less a set uh, because it's not as complicated as a sh of a shock. Um, this shock, um, the own owner, Rebuildable. If um, what I steer steer people towards is, hey, if you have a shock dyno um, or you know somebody who does, and you have a pretty decent level of shock building experience, you could rebuild this yourself. If you're just in your garage um, with a basic set of tools and you don't have a shock dyno, I don't recommend it. Like, I won't rebuild my kid's shock at the track if I don't have the dyno there because there's a lot of little pieces in here, and if one little thing doesn't go back together right. Um, the shock won't work properly, and the only way to know that is on the dyno. So if you don't have a dyno um, or access to a dyno, and you don't have a decent level of shock building experience, I wouldn't take one apart if I were you. Um, leave it to us or one of our rebuilders. But this is the newest shock, and this is what we sell the most of because people um, like the fact that it's less maintenance, a little bit less money. And uh, this is what I run on Hudson's car. Um, so I had that question this weekend. Why not launch you on the through shafts? Uh, I want to prove that this performs just as well at the through shaft at a lower price point. Um, trust me, if I felt the through shaft had any little bit of uh, improvement, uh, that's what would be on my kid's car. So this is what we choose to run, um, and, and that's um, the shock. So that kind of runs through all the different iterations. Um, if you have an RS Junior, that can be updated all the way to a JR3 um, with piston change and stuff. Um, however, um, anything prior to a J JR4 can't be updated because that's a new body, new base valve. It's 100% different. Actually, the right height adjuster is different. 
Um, we wanted to make the thread pitch a little finer than what the AFCO style body was uh, for finer adjustment. Um, so if you have a JR3, it can't be updated to a four. Um, we do do a trade-in program. We are rich in used through shafts at the moment. We took a bunch on trade um, over the off season that we're still kind of working through and getting freshened. So the trade value on a through shaft isn't super high at the moment. But if you had an AFCO, an older RS junior that you wanted to update to a four, um, we do have a trade-in program if you want to do that. So let me see what we've got going here as far as questions. If I could get it pulled up. Turn the volume down so I don't hear myself. And is any, I don't know that uh, I see any questions yet, but if anybody has any questions, fire away at those. Uh, more than happy to answer a quarter midget question or a big shot question. Um, again, these we do these every Monday and um, the questions you ask don't have to pertain to the topic. We've just found that having a topic kind of helps get things rolling with everybody. Um, but if you have a torsion bar question, a sprint car shot question, uh, we'll certainly answer that. Um, if you don't have a question, that's fine too. Um, I know we have a bunch of people that are just getting adjusted to the new time slot of doing it at noon. Um, as we talked last week, that just is better uh, for us here. Um, allows us to have a camera guy. It's going to allow us to bring guests in and just do some different things. Um, not doing it in the middle of the night. And if you can't watch live, that's no problem. Um, they are posted to our YouTube page and our Facebook page after the fact. So. No questions. We got a quiet Monday. Um, that's okay. We will go ahead and sign off if nobody has any questions. If um, you watch this after the fact and you have a question, go ahead and ask it. I will try to personally answer it. And then, worst case, we will um, answer it next week. Okay, so we do have one question. Um, how do you select correct valving for a quarter midget? Harry, that's a great question. Um, and it's a little hard to answer. I would say uh, for us, it's based on eight years of building quarter midget shocks and testing and developing and big races and working with customers. So a really good note base. Um, so if you order shocks, whether you call in or you order them online, we ask a couple questions. Um, how much does the driver weigh? What type of chassis it is? What type of tracks are you racing? From there, we would go to our notebook and say, this is what we found to work the best in that situation with that size driver, and that's what we would build for you. Um, if you have valvings that you prefer, we can certainly do that as well, um, but we do have a really good database of notes for pretty much about every chassis at this point. Um, we've built stuff for Pfizer's and Nervos, Bull Riders, Storm, Stanley, Sherman, um, pretty much every car you can think of at this point, we've built um, some shocks for, whether it's dirt or asphalt. So. Um, Shane, good question. Trade-in program once a year or different times throughout the year. So we do a trade-in program in October and November every year. Um, and that point, we'll take any shock's got a value, we say. If it's a shock off a of 78 Malibu, we'll give you something for it and trade towards a new CSI shock. Um, after that period, we're selective with the trade-ins, um, basically because we get so many. Uh, it's like, hey, do we have any of those? So if you want to trade in, for example, right now, if you want to trade in a set of micro shocks for a new set, contact us. We would probably take those on trade because we're totally out of used micro shocks. And we always have customers that maybe can't afford new shocks or are just looking for a good used set of spares. Um, and so we try to keep some of those throughout the year. If you want to trade in through shaft quarter midget shocks right now, we've got so many of them, the value is going to be really low and we would tell you that. Um, if you want to trade in a set of super shocks, we wouldn't take those at the moment just because I know they're going to sit here for at least a year before we have anything to do, uh, have any time to do anything with them. So kind of a case by case basis outside of that October, November window. Um, so if you have something you want to trade, just shoot me a message and we will get that taken care of. Um, Alan, your thoughts on reverse split torsion bars on a micro. Uh, I personally am not a big reverse split guy. Uh, we have some customers who have been very successful with it. Um, I know other teams have been very successful with it. When I drove race cars many years ago, and then more recently when I've been a crew chief and set cars up, I've always struggled with reverse split. Um, as a driver, I didn't really like the feel of it. Um, I just always felt like the car was out of balance. And then as a mechanic, I kind of 
I don't know if it's just beating in my head driving a few poor handling race cars with reverse split or not, um, but I just never felt like the car did what I wanted it to with reverse split. So typically, uh, we're positive split, um, track slicks off, we're paired up, or we're paired up and the track slicks off, we might go a little bit softer. So, great questions. We appreciate you guys uh, asking those. Um, no other questions at this point. Again, if we miss your question, ask it and we will answer it after the fact. Um, certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Hope you have a great week. Uh, share this video with your friends so we can help uh, spread the word. Thank you guys.